to call the meeting to, more, to order. Uh, today is what, November 3rd? Mm -hmm. Right side. The meeting of November 3rd to order. Um, we have a quorum. In fact, I think we have a full board. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> so uh, welcome um, to our newest board member. And uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, we start off with non-agenda public comment. We have one public comment. And we have speaker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, have, we actually have two speakers. Um, one, we don't have any more. OK. We have Joe Flynn and not the other one. In that case, I'd like to ask Mr. Sure. Um, maybe I'd ask our new board member to introduce himself and tell us just briefly um, how he got here. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Alma Sudris. I am uh, currently serving as the Director of Performance and Analytics at the City of San Diego. Uh, in previous life, I also worked at the State of California, both in the legislature as well as at the uh, State State Auditor's Office. Um, I like numbers, so that might be one reason why uh, some saw fit for me to serve on this board. I greatly appreciate the honor of being appointed, and I hope I, I only hope I can follow in the footsteps of my predecessor Natasha, who served extremely well um, and has given me a lot of good tips about how well this board functions and how I need to uh, behave myself to make sure that it continues to do so. <laughs> Thank you very much, Almas. Mark? I'd like to piggyback on that almost to say that I love numbers, so I'm glad you're on the board because we like numbers loving people on our board. <laughs> <clears throat> and I wanted to follow up your comments about uh, succeeding Natasha. We asked Natasha to come today because she had a chance to escape without us publicly recognizing her before. So I have uh, a certificate that I'd like to present her with, but let me just sort of read it into the record and then I'll call her forward for a photo op here. So the Board of Administration of San Diego City Employees Retirement System hereby expresses its appreciation to, to Natasha Kalura for your advice, collegiality, commitment, and service to the Board of Administration staff and SDSERS members, retirees, and beneficiaries. So it's been signed by all your cohorts up here. Natasha served as all of you know, or most of you know, for four years on the board. She served as the Disability Committee Chairperson for the last few, it did an outstanding job. Uh, we are very much going to miss her input, her uh, critical thinking, her questioning of what we do up here. We appreciate the fact that it's a diverse board with different points of view, and uh, we really like that. So, Natasha, if you'd come up, I'll ask Cynthia Queen to take a picture for her. So here you go. Also, on behalf of the board, Natasha, thank you for an outstanding four years. All right, uh, that brings us to our public speaker, Joe Flynn. Thank you, uh, President Hoy, members of the board. Uh, you notice that the other speaker has withdrawn. I think they, they ceded their minutes to me. <laughs> Great, just, you, you just have kidding. one and a half minutes then. <laughs> At the, uh, at the last meeting, I went over all the good things about Mark Hovey, and it took all of my time. So today, I wanted to use the time to thank all of you, elected and appointed, for your valuable service as trustees to SIRS. Your presence makes this board unique. It is the only one in California that is an independent board. And the skills and experience that you bring to this board make it one of the most successful. SIRS could not afford to pay for the time and expertise that you devote to this board. And I include the elected trustees to that dedication as well. It's a critical mix. 
Former president of the board, Peter Provolos, said on more than one occasion that he was amazed about the difference between the private sector and government. Peter and the appointed board members were very uh, skilled in the private sector and with the help of the elected members, uh, mastered the governmental side. Together, they led the board out of troubled times. Today, this board and your dedication and diligence and a high performing staff has kept SIRS in the forefront of well-managed pension funds. Please know that the active and retired members are grateful for your service and the citizens of San Diego should also know that they are well served by the dedicated SIRS volunteers. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to have Joe speak to us, uh, particularly when he's blowing smoke at us like that. So thank you very much. So <clears throat> that brings us to the uh, approval of consent agenda items A through D, which are under tabs two, three, four, and five of the board materials. If uh, anyone wants to pull any of those items for discussion, we can do so now. Otherwise, we'll vote on them as a package. All right. Do we need a second on this one? We do. Okay, so I've made the motion. Uh, Jeff Wallace has seconded the motion. Ready to vote. <coughs> All votes are in. All right, that motion carries 13 to zero. Um, that brings us to the audit committee report, and I believe Roberta Spoon is gonna present that report today. <coughs> This Wednesday, we had an audit committee meeting, and the purpose of the meeting was to discuss and review a preliminary draft of the 2017 CAFR. Um, the committee asked various questions and comments. Basically, the meeting was uh, wordsmithing and reviewing and understanding some of the comments that were included in the CAFR. Uh, they were clarified for us, and um, we will meet again next month uh, to review those changes. And the committee complimented the staff. Um, thank you very much to staff for getting it done in such a timely fashion. Lee and your team have certainly done an excellent job and I understand it's, um, it has, is a long way from where it started. So thank you very much for your commitment and please communicate that to your staff. It's a challenge, I understand. So thank you very much, and we'll get back with you next month. Thank you, Bobby. Um, next, we have Disability Committee and Charlie Hogquist. Good morning. Yesterday, I got to chair my uh, first Disability Committee after my voluntary appointment. Um, <laughs> at our meeting, we, we had um, three uh, recommendations from staff, two to uh, approve disability retirements, one to deny. All were passed unanimously, and there were no other items discussed at that time. Do we need, uh, we need a motion, no seconds required. So Charlie, you make the motion, there we go. Oh, we, Mike, uh, you've got to back out so Charlie can make the motion and then it, no second. Great. Ready to vote. <coughs> All votes are in. All right, and that carried 13 to nothing. That brings us to business and governance, Tanasi Priovolos. All right, so um, let's see. I think we are. Uh, I think we are going to pull items one and four um, from the uh, consent agenda. The uh, items two, three, five, six, and seven passed unanimously at yesterday's BNG meeting. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll move those items if somebody wants to.
ready to vote. All votes are in. And that passes 13 to zero. All right, um, let's see. Let's deal with the uh, the first item, which is a uh, review of the insurance covering SD SERDs renewal. So we had a, uh, that was that was certainly the bulk of our of our meeting yesterday, that was over an hour. Um, I'll tell you what, you get the insurance guys talking and they just never shut up, ever. Um, so, but in any event, they were gonna talk until they sold us something, so anyway. But the good news is the- What uh, happened is they were grilled. <laughs> probably. <laughs> Um, so the, the issue that we had was that there were some there were some competing options that you saw. Um, the I think the the gist of the issue is is that the that we are frustrated. At least the committee members were frustrated that the premiums still are above the norm or the average for plans of our size uh, for this fiduciary coverage. And the reality is, it's been 12 years since the events occurred that caused those increases and it's been nine years since those events were resolved um, and it's just been lagging. Um, there's really no good reason for that to happen and so uh, the committee is sort of su suggesting a couple of things. Number one, that we uh, look at increasing the, d the retention amount. The retention amount that we currently have is 1.5 million. We're talking about increasing that to $2 million. The primary purpose for that is to save cost, to help drive the cost of the insurance down. Uh, to reduce the burden on the plan and the and the the city and the and the employees, and then also and the other reason for that is that we haven't had any claims. Uh, we've the, the plan is the, the system is well run. We haven't had claims, um, so we don't think the risk is substantial. The second issue that we had was that the traditional carriers that we've used, which is RLI and Chubb, uh, with um, with with Hudson as sort of the uh, as a as the side A carrier, that scenario. Um, has been, uh, it, it, there's a new entry, Hudson has entered the market in, as the primary, and they can, they have offered and put together a package that will um, be substantially cheaper than um, simply the RLI Chubb combination that we've had for some time. And so um, the committee has sort of recommended a, a, a three-part issue. What we're sort of saying is, hey, we'll accept option one, which is what we currently have, current terms, um, that, that exist on a renewal unless the premium for, R, for the RLI Chubb combination uh, is uh, it, it, with a $2 million retention is $227,500 or less, which we believe it will be. In fact, I think the, in, the insurance guys guaranteed it would be. I, I can't remember exactly how they phrased it, but I think they said, my, my reputation on this, I stake it, or something like that, I don't know. But, um, and then the second, the second option that we've asked for is that if the, if the premium on the Hudson as primary carrier with two, point, with $2 million in coverage is at least $10,000 lower than the RLI and Chubb policy for the same coverage, then we would ask uh, for them to, to also pick that up. So there's a, there's I a- I think it was 20 million in coverage with a $5 million uh, excess. Is that, is that right, Johnny? Sorry, the excess is five. Right. I'm sorry, Val. Could you please ask your question yeah. again? Was it was it not a twenty million dollar policy with a? Fi I thought it was a total of twenty five million dollars of coverage. Yes. So the twenty million would be Hudson as primary and taking over that secondary spot with the five million as an excess carrier. And then then we're only talking about the difference between a one point five or a two million dollar self insured retention, which people can think of as like a deductible, um, but there is no deductible or self insured retention when there is a claim against a trustee and there is no indemnification of the trustee. So if there's a claim made against an individual trustee and no one, meaning the city, doesn't indemnify the trustee for that claim, then the coverage would drop down and provide coverage to any of the trustees with no deductible or self-insured retention under any of these scenarios. So I don't want people on the board to be mistakenly thinking that they're responsible for the first million and a half or two million of defense costs because it's they're not. Um, that deductible or self-insured retention applies only for claims against the system. And the costs that we would incur um, under the retention, the first million and a half or two million dollars of cost associated with a claim, um, would ultimately be passed through either through the ARC or it would be paid directly by the city, it would have to be because that would be the way that we would uh, handle that expense. 
So um, what we were trying to do is see if we could drive the premium cost down closer to $200,000, which we thought was a more reasonable number, by tweaking the policy slightly and then going to a, uh, a different carrier to create a little more competition. We've been with RLI Chubb throughout this period, and our premium has was, was in the $600,000 plus range just five years ago, and it's been dropping. So it dropped $80,000 this year. Notwithstanding that it's been dropping like that, we're not satisfied because similar systems would be paying, we think, more in the hundred and fifty dollars to $200,000 range for this same coverage, and we would like to send the message that there's competition out there. So we pushed a little bit to try and get this other carrier, Hudson, into the game. Our insurance broker, John Niedenhofer, was very happy with Hudson and felt that was a very good alternative, but he had less experience, he had no experience with Hudson handling claims like this, and he did have experience with Chubb and RLI. And for that reason, he had a slight preference to stay with Chubb RLI. We pushed back on that. Um, Hudson's a very good company. I think uh, Charlie, a lot of people may know them here. So we felt that if we could get a savings, particularly in light of all the hundreds of thousands of dollars that Chubb and RLI have made in premiums on us over the past few years, um, it was time to make that change, or at least propose it. So I think that, in a nutshell, is where we were. I think that's true. The, the one thing I just want to point out is that the reason that uh, that our broker, John and, and Dave, did not have experience with Hudson on paying claims. They're a new entrance enter, entrance into the market for primary coverage. So they just don't have they just haven't been handling the primary piece before. So there is they've been our excess carrier for years. Absolutely. So when when I when he says there's no experience or no claims, it's not because they haven't been around or haven't done things. They just haven't been in this space as the primary carrier. So I'm sorry. Is, uh, yes, uh, we were uh, at Shepherd Ventures, my company. Uh, we were covered by Chubb for a long time, and um, you know, like you, we were having nosebleed with the premium. Uh, it was pretty high, and so we did a beauty contest, and we chose Hudson, and um, we're quite happy with them. We're still covered by them, and they were significantly less, um, and they're they're a good company. So I I think it's a good deal. Okay. So basically, if, if you adopt the proposal that's in front of you, what we're saying is, is that we will accept the, wait, I, I think, I'm sorry, Bill, you're in the queue. I missed you. I apologize. Yeah, I had a question. So um, you said you did a review of the other uh, pension plans that were similar size and the premiums were around 150000 or something like that. Who were the carriers that they used? You know? So I, I don't know that it would be fair to say that we did a review. What's what's fair to say is that we asked the brokers to give us their uh, their feeling based on their experience in this marketplace, what premiums should be for a plan of our size um, with with this coverage. The, the problem is, is that there, there are all kinds of differences between systems in terms of the way they govern themselves, uh, how much money is under management, how the management process works, wh wh you know, those types of issues. And as you've heard, even, you know, even with, with Joe's comment, we are unique in that we are technically an independent board. All these things play into coverage. But I think what, what our carrier is saying is, yeah, it, all else being equal, if you didn't have the history that you had, $150,000, $200,000 would be probably a normal range. And we're still well above that. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, that's good. Okay, so, all right, I don't see anybody else in the queue. So the issue here is, is that if you're going to go with, um, if, if the, the recommendation as it stands now is, okay, it, all else being equal, we'll, we'll renew the existing coverage we have unless there are co cost savings within a certain range for increasing the, deductible, the retention to $2 million. And th then we would take that option automatically. The, the, the brokers would buy in that policy, and they would, if there's, an additional savings within certain ranges for going with Hudson as the primary, then they would bind that policy. So it's kind of a it's kind of a menu for it's a, it's a directive back to the care, to the brokers with a menu of options based on certain trigger points. Okay. Part of that is driven by the timing. Correct. We've got our, our policy insure expires in December fifteenth. December fifteenth. So uh, so the issue is because of that short window, and we aren't going to be meeting again. We need to make sure that we can bind coverage and provide enough instructions. So, Johnny, do you have anything else you want to add to the amazing words that were so eloquently stated by Val? 
No, I do have John Dienhofer here in case you wanted a clarification from your broker. To be sold again, another pitch? I don't think so, please. <laughs> I'm sorry. If you, That's not fair. One, one of the things that we did talk about yesterday was how much we appreciate what John has done for this system and the hard work and, and uh, uh, the, the honest work that he's done for us. It's very much appreciated. We don't have criticisms of John. No, but I'm still going to harass him. The one thing I, we should say is that John's group was the group that came in and was able to help us restructure and get the insurance in the first place, and he's the one that's been ratcheting it down. So um, I'm, I'm still going to tease him for being above norms for us, but he has done phenomenal work. So I don't know if there's any reason to bring John up, but it's up to you, Johnny. I'll also say in response to Bill's comment that I'm the source of the estimate of 150 to 200 thousand dollars, not John. I don't believe John quoted us any number on what the normal cost of insurance would be. Um, Mark did a little bit of background searching on that. Maybe we ought to at least bring that out, but that was some years ago. At a round table of my peers a couple years ago, I just asked for a show of hands of the 20 or 25 CEOs in the room what they were paying for premiums. At that point, we were close to the $600,000 range, and the next highest premium of anyone in the room was around $200,000 for a system that was five times larger than we were. So that led me to believe that what was far more common was premiums that were in the fifty dollars to $100,000 range. Now, that also is not necessarily an apples and apples comparison because we have $25 million of coverage, and it's my understanding, albeit from that brief survey two years ago, that our level of coverage is higher than what most systems have, maybe for good and varied reasons. We initially got coverage 10 years ago at a $10 million level, and then through John's work with our board, we've increased that up to 25 million, which we believe is still appropriate. Thank you. So there's nobody else in the queue. Can we, uh, are we ready to vote on this issue? Do we need a second, Johnny? Well, we didn't vote on it. We tabled it yesterday, so maybe we do. No, we need a second no, we, for this one. We today. did vote on this one. We just had a shorter wording. It was motion to pick option one with modifications, and then today we have all the detailed wording on those modifications. Okay. But I guess my, well. I don't know. Um, I, I would feel more, uh, on the theory, and this is a maxim of jurisprudence in the state of California, that superfluity does not vitiate. I would prefer to have a second, even if it's unnecessary. I agree. I don't know if we can modify that in Sire, so maybe we'll just. Yeah. Sanasi's moved it. Does someone want to raise their hand for a yeah, second? Yeah, I think we'll. I'll, I'll raise my hand for a second. Okay. <clears throat> Ready to vote. <laughs> what voting? I'll vote to end. All right, so that passes 13 to zero. Um, so just reporting to see, so item number, I guess we're on A2. Okay, actually those all passed on consent. So now we're on- John. On item four, stack, staff's recommendation to revise the contracting policy for goods and services. So the, um, in this case, what we had was, uh, we, we pulled that from the, uh, from the meeting yesterday because there, was, there were a couple of items. Predominantly, uh, Bobby identified uh, two items in particular that, had, uh, that she had some concerns about based on her experience uh, that she thought needed to be addressed. We asked staff to go back and uh, address those issues. And um, the handout that's in front of you, uh, the, the, the red line in red is what was there previously. The red line in blue are the updates or amendments as a result of uh, Bobby's comments and staff's good work. And I guess I see that Ted has drawn the short straw to have to come up and defend this position and tell Bobby why she's completely wrong and full of hot air for her changes and why we shouldn't accept them. Is that, did I frame that correctly for you, Ted? Yeah. With exception. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. It's no Thank accident you. that he's sitting in what used to be Dick Tart's chair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The, he let me his speedos, so it's all good. We're all good. The B&G committee didn't take action on this uh, in light of Bobby's comments, and Bobby wasn't able to, to be at the committee yesterday, so we wanted to 
give a chance for us to revise this and then Bobby to comment on it. Um, Ted's up here because he's instrumental in approving these payments and understanding the process more than I can. And so he's here as my backup. Uh, Bobby, you're here to comment on it, but I would, I think it's safe to say her um, <clears throat> comments related to reducing the authority of staff other than the CEO for the amounts that they can approve and increasing Mark's oversight of those approvals. So consistent with that, the changes that staff has made from what you have reviewed previously are in blue. And I'll take one minute to walk through them. The changes in lower- Actually, Johnny, if I, before we just hold up, Bobby, do you have any comments that you want to make ahead of this about your what your observations are? Do you want, are you okay just jumping straight into- I'm okay just jumping right in. I've reviewed the changes and um, and I agree with them. Okay. I mean, they're exactly what I was hoping would be done. Thank you Thank very you. much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. So we reduce. So Ted, you're not just a, an <coughs> instrument or tool, as Johnny would suggest. You actually have are a, a high level thinker who's solved all these issues. Thank you, Ted. We reduced the controller's <laughs> authority from fifty thousand to twenty five thousand. Now it requires the CEO signature as well for amounts of fifty thousand dollars or less. For legal fees, it now requires the joint signatures of the CEO and the general counsel. Ted has broken up the investment-related expenses from the budgeting operating expenses for clarification. We've also included a reference to our internal um, approval of operate, budgeted operating expenses. <clears throat> and lastly, for foreign, I'm sorry, two more items for foreign trade accounts and the other items listed under subpart three, <clears throat> it now takes the signature of the CEO and an additional person. And the last one for opening of any domestic bank accounts, operating benefits, tax or legal expenses, it takes the signatures of both the controller and the CEO. Thank you, Val, you're in the queue. I just wanna ask our CIO whether these changes are acceptable and, and approved, and I'm getting a thumbs up. Um, okay, I guess the, uh, the only question on that is, is Lee, do you have any comments on it? I do not. All right. Is that, is that good or bad that you have no comments on it? That is good. Okay, good. Just checking. All right. Nobody else in the queue? I think we're, thank you very much, Ted. Thank you, Johnny. So we are uh, ready to, to, to vote on that issue. I'm happy to move it if there's a button, but we do need a second. Ready to vote. All votes are in. And that ma ma uh, motion passes 13 to 0. Okay, moving to old business. Uh, we uh, received Marcel's report on over payments to members exceeding $10,000. Two payments have been paid in full. Uh, we also received Marcel's report on cate categorical uh, correction project, and the staff has completed the review of member accounts identified as potentially having an error. All members subject to a correction have been notified, which I'm sure just made their day in advance of the holidays. Um, all right, so with no action requested. I think the um, you guys have all read the reports, uh, and uh, there were there were no questions coming out of committee. But does anybody? There's I guess let me ask this question: Does anybody on the board have any questions of any of staff as to these reports or alternatively is there any staff that has any additional comments or or uh, changes to our augmentation of the reports that they have submitted okay so I see nothing in the queue no hands from staff so I think we're uh, we're good to go with that I'll hand the meeting back to you Val Thank you, Tanasi. Um, Hollywood out there, if anybody in Hollywood is watching this show, this is Tanasi Priovalos, and he does, he is available. <laughs> All right, so um, investment committee, um, <clears throat> Carol Broad. Hello. Uh, we had an investment committee meeting yesterday with our full uh, group of five. It was uh, not super, oh, sorry. It was not super eventful. We had one action item. Uh, that we will need to vote on now, and Jamie is going to summarize that for us. Thank you. Similar to the GCM Grosvenor annual investment plan that the board approved at the last meeting, this is the annual process that st staff undertakes with StepStone. 
The annual investment plan gives a program overview, summary of investments, an updated pacing model, and the highlights and initiatives for the upcoming year. Over the next year, Stepstone is proposing $75 million in new commitments. This is down from the previous 100 million in the previous year. The slowdown in pacing will help to bring Stepstone's allocation closer to its target of 6.5%. In terms of deployment, Stepstone expects to continue to favor opportunistic investments in secondaries, co-investments, and season primaries to minimize the J-curve and increase early distributions. They will have a focus on infrastructure over the next year, and they are targeting investments in things such as data centers and telecom as their primary areas of focus. Within private equity, they are looking to target healthcare and industrials as areas of interest for new potential investments. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Questions? Okay, then we're ready to vote, and I guess I can move that. Ready to vote. All votes are in. And that passed 13 to nothing. Um, Jamie, you can just stay there. We're going to, um, the rest of our items were not action items, but we're just briefly going to cover them. Um, there's some good news in here and, and interesting information. And of course, you're all welcome to study all the presentations for as long as you'd like. Um, we had an interesting educational presentation from our general consultant, Aon Hewitt, on the infrastructure asset class. Um, Aon Hewitt originally scoped out this asset class for us, uh, and it's now managed by Grosvenor and Stepstone, who each have a 3%, um, excuse me, the, the fund has a 3% target to infrastructure, and each manager has a 1.5% uh, target. And uh, they manage that together with their private equity allocations so that each manager has about 6.5% of, of our portfolio. Um, the presentation discusses infrastructure investing at a very high level. Um, as you know, infrastructure includes hard assets that provide essential services in the economy, like electricity networks, airports, seaports, road and rail, and in, in some cases, some more esoteric sort of things that we are involved in. Um, they, these assets provide sustainable cash flow, potential for inflation-correlated revenues, and low correlation to traditional assets. The, the presentation discusses the range of risk return options in infrastructure and different ways to implement. Um, as, you, as you know, or as I mentioned, we, we are focused on the more opportunistic end of the spectrum, um, and this is sort of consistent with the, the philosophies of Grosvenor and, and Stepstone, and, and the returns have generally been very attractive, um, with some exceptions in the energy sector that we think are now improving. Uh, but as a takeaway from this review, which was very helpful to us, uh, we'll be working with Aon Hewitt and staff to, to think a little bit further about where we are in the risk spectrum, whether it might be appropriate to dial that down a little bit, given where we are uh, in the economic cycle, and to think about what appropriate benchmarks are going forward. So that is a summary of the presentation, if anyone has any questions. Um, seeing none, I will go to the, the next item, uh, which was the annual report on State Street's investment compliance monitoring program. Uh, we've been doing this since 2004. Uh, it's an add-on application with State Street that um, checks our listed asset portfolios against the manager's guidelines. And to date, we've had no violations. And again, we had no violations. Um, so with that, I'm going to move to item four. And really, I think the, the balance of these items, Jamie's going to summarize very briefly. Yes. Uh, so I left a handout for each of you, uh, each of your seats. Um, it's an updated copy of the summary disclosure that I'm about to talk about. Um, we had discovered an error too late to send it out to you electronically. So the summary document is the first annual uh, private markets fee reporting in compliance with California, California Government Code Section 7514.7, .7, or AB 2833, as it was previously known. The law was designed to increase transparency among California public pension plans in private market investments. Because this is an emerging best practice, staff will be following up with other public pension plans to research their disclosures to look for ways that we can potentially improve our disclosure going forward. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions that you have about the disclosure. Okay. Great. 
Go on. Great. Move yeah. on. Yeah. You can go on. Uh, next, we have the uh, Deutsche Asset Management um, IMA transition. Um, as a reminder, the Deutsche Asset Management separate account is in the process of being wound down and liquidated. The, this was an effort to de-risk the real estate portfolio. Deutsche Asset Management continues to make great progress. To date, we have sold eight properties into the market. Five of those have actually been sold, and then three were swapped for shares into a core commingled fund. Four assets are currently in the market, and two are being explored for sale this year. Um, the other four remaining assets continue to perform as expected and will be sold over the next three years at the latest. It, that could slip or come forward if we get favorable information. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Questions? No questions? So we now have just a couple of status reports. Yes. The first is the Stepstone, Stepstone Atlantic. Sorry, waiting. There we go. I have Stepstone's private equity infrastructure performance report for the quarter and fiscal year ended June 30th, 2017. As of June 30th, the Stepstone net IRR on a combined basis was 4.2%, which held steady from the previous quarter. Breaking that down a little further, Stepstone's private equity net IRR was 16.2%, while the infrastructure net IRR was 6.4%. Each component continues to, perform, to outperform in relation to its benchmark. And I'd be happy to answer any questions there. If not, I'll move along to GCM Grosvenor. I have in front of you GCM Grosvenor's private equity and infrastructure performance report for the quarter and fiscal year ended June 30th, 2017. As of June 30th, GCM Grosvenor had a net IRR on a combined basis of 16.5%, which is uh, slightly up from the previous quarter, uh, up by 10 basis points, excuse me. And breaking that down a little further, GCM Grosvenor's private equity net IRR was 17.9%, while the infrastructure net IRR was 11.2%. And each of these components continues to outperform in relation to its benchmark. Any questions? And finally, for real estate. As of June 30th, 2017, a real estate portfolio had a return of 2.1% versus the benchmark at 1.7% for the quarter. For the one-year period, SDSERS had a 8.2% return versus the benchmark at 6.8. Um, that is great absolute performance as well as relative. Um, over the longer time periods, um, SDSERS continues to outperform uh, with the exception of the 10-year period, uh, which is still reflecting the global financial crisis. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. I have a comment, Carol. Comment from Bill. Um, one of the things I was a little surprised at in, in walking through the real estate uh, performance report is the 26 small managers that we have. So I'd like to have a request that um, you take those 26 managers. I can see what the funded commitment is and the unfunded commitment. Uh, and I know that they're beginning to roll off. But I'd like to know what the leverage ratios are on those 26 funds, mainly because my concern is that if we do go into a down cycle and we have a number of small funds, they're more at risk than the big <coughs> funds if they're highly levered. So. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. And you went for each of the 26 or just for the ones that are going to be rolling off? Uh, all of them. I do all, all 26. Of them? Okay. Yeah. That's easy enough. That's a great Thank comment, you. Bill. Great. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get that for you. Great. Okay. Um, thank you, Jamie. Thank Appreciate you. your comments. Uh, Demetrios is going to come up for one brief item, and while he's doing that, I, I just want to uh, reiterate that the the things that Jamie reviewed, the two private equity managers uh, who also manage infrastructure and real estate are important um, alpha generating parts of our portfolio, uh, private assets that are uncorrelated with the listed markets and are just an important anchor in our portfolio going forward and they're, and they're doing really well. And Dimitrios has a public comment for us. <laughs> the, I'm going to give the investment division staff report. Right. Uh, for the record, the reconciled market value of assets as of September 30th was $7.98 billion. Since the last meeting, there have been two monthly wires that were sent out, 
in August and September, totaling approximately $67.3 million for the monthly benefit payments. In addition, there were five weekly wires sent out, totaling approximately $5.5 million for payroll payments and operating expenses. There was one rebalancing action that was initiated on October 16th. $30 million was taken from U.S. equity, $30 million was taken from non-U.S. equity, and $10 million was taken from global equity, and this total amount of $70 million was allocated to U.S. fixed income. Finally, staff has been working with Aon Hewitt to issue a custodial bank RFP in early December. I want to emphasize that once this is issued, there will be a quiet period for SD SERS, and staff will let the investment committee know once that has happened. Great. Thank you, Demetrios. And that concludes our report on the investment committee. Great. Thank you, Carol. Brings us to uh, training and uh, Johnny Tran. Thank you, Val. We have one training request from Carol Broad to attend the NASM in uh, fiduciary conference in San Francisco in November. Carol, I believe Bill will be there, and I will be there too. So, oh, cool. excited to have you. Otherwise, uh, Mark Hovey has sent each of you a letter recommending the class, the courses he recommends you take, past on, based on your position here, how long you've been here and the courses that you've taken in the past. So we'd love to hear back from you by December 15th, I believe, so we can all vote on it as a group at the January meeting. So everybody has homework. Okay. And you'll have another swing at the plate if you don't get it all approved then. This would be especially important if you wanted to go to any conferences in the first quarter of 18 or first half of the year. Some of the conferences, of course, that are being held in the latter half of 2018, they're not date certain yet. So if you're not sure whether you want to go to something in the fall of 18 and the date's not certain, you can certainly hold off on signing up for that at this point. Right. I'll need a first and a second on the request. Ready to vote. All votes are in. All right. So that carried? Yes. Anything else, Johnny? No. All right. That brings us to questions and comments from presidents, trustees, and president, trustees, and staff. President has no comments. Um, do any other trustees or staff members wish to comment? Great. Um, non docketed items, we have none. Uh, so we will adjourn into closed session and then report out when we're done. Oh, wait a minute, Mr. Flynn has a comment and I will call on him. You have 20 minutes, Mr. Flynn. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, I did have a, uh, a, a request to speak slip in there. I had tied it to a the disability report, which I know is a non-action report, but I was going to request some action from the board. There was one item uh, mentioned that the comparative studies show that SERS only approves about 57% of the disability uh, requests. That's, that's showing a, a very thorough line. I think Los Angeles County is approving something like 97%. So that's, that's taken care of. But there's uh, one item that has bothered me when I was on the board, and it still bothers me, and I hope it bothers you. And that is in the annual review of the disability uh, retirees, they must submit a, a form showing that, A, that they are still disabled. That's a very high standard. Also, very few other uh, retirement systems do that. But there is one item in there that they require that from all disability retirees. Case in point, police officer Don, uh, um, Dan Tonic lost his leg in the line of duty. He was granted a disability retirement. Each year, this retired officer must submit a form 
an analysis showing that he still qualifies for disability retirement. I think that is unnecessary, egregious, and I think it should be corrected. Granted, it will be, it will take some time and effort to draw that line between which disability uh, retirement applications fall in that permanent category. But that's what the board is here for, to make those kinds of determinations. There are others besides Officer Tonic, but that is, that is the top of the line, and there are others where the line goes to there, but that, I think, really needs to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Flynn. That's an excellent point, and I think we should look into whether there is a potential to uh, grant waivers from that requirement, um, and if so, how would we pursue legislatively uh, that modification? Mark? We'll include that in our January board meeting discussion. Great. Or disability committee stuff. I also want to comment on, on one of the statistics uh, that Mr. Flynn raised. We did have a discussion in the disability committee yesterday <clears throat> about uh, uh, the relative statistics in our system and other systems for granting disability retirements. And um, th there is a 57% approval rate for applications in our system. There is a much higher approval rate in certain other systems in the state, upwards of 90% in most of them. There's a reason for that, which we didn't get into in the discussion today, but perhaps we ought to come back and report to the full board at some point later, uh, early next year perhaps, on this. Um, our system does not have certain presumptions in favor of granting disabilities that exist in other systems. Many of the systems, most of the uh, retirees or, or employees in the state are members of systems where there are presumptions of disability when you have certain heart conditions, when even certain cancers, um, uh, and we don't have that. It, the burden is, in our system is always on the employee to demonstrate the disability and the relationship to the job, which doesn't exist in all the other systems. So I think our statistics are in line with other systems like ours, the few other systems like ours, that have this particular arrangement where the burden of proof is on the applicant. Um, but they're different than those systems where the burden of proof basically is satisfied by a presumption. So that, ex I think, explains the difference in those statistics, and it's worth having a discussion at the board level, I think, sometime early next year about that. So thank you very much for bringing that up, uh, Mr. Flynn, and we'll have more to say on that at a future meeting. Any other public comment or non-docket items? Seeing none, um, we'll adjourn into closed session.
us out of order because folks who um, discussed topics in closed session will still work out finished early. And that'll be uh, so moved for I know. <laughs> <laughs> We we were on closed session for both these issues because you had to state what it was for. Council not showing up. Not qualified for this. No, he was on his way. What happened was this um, committee realized we were going to finish so early. He told me to get here about ten thirty. But everyone's still coming in. Aren't we supposed to remain in closed? Yeah, yeah, we are, but they may be part of the discussion. Oh, see, this is why we needed a consultant was for this kind of stuff. That's right. Well, I'm thinking that our number. But then again, if we can buy an insurance before that, I mean, you want me to keep them in line and yeah, I will bring all the appropriate the, the baton and the uh, yeah, might bring a cane. That's right. <laughs> um, well, that was the other thing, by the way. Just Chris, sorry, thank you. Uh, you have a much better jacket, though. Sorry, it's not nice. Is, does it make any sense to take some some of the basic sort of?
We're going to come back and revisit the timing. Well, all right. At this point, we're going to have our meeting with. Uh, at this point, we're going to have our meeting with uh, outside legal counsel, and I'm going to call on Johnny Tran to make this presentation. Hey, thank you, Val. So I brought Dave Noonan with with me. He's our outside counsel for litigation matters. He's done this since 2010. We're going to talk.
certainly seems frustrated that the money just part is for years waiting on someone else to do their thing, right? No. I'm going with management to the Union Tribune on Tuesday. This oh. paper the editorial board. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's accounting rules I about start away from here, so how you can classify a restricted uh, Come back. I'm going to just yeah. the manager. Yeah. That's, That's what I was going to do. Vote. It's 288 million. It's classified under the definition of gas fee. Move forward. Forward to it. As unrestricted. I'm going to use the manager in the middle. Come back. We'll okay, get the report out. Yep. Um, we'll be here. Well, 70 percent of it are loans that are already made. Hey, good job on this. Mm. <laughs> yeah, thanks, yeah. man. It's fun. So that's in the reserve. Uh, and sure. Know, so it's it's non-profits. It's yeah. funny. It, it, it made it sound like it's unrestricted funds, but they're all designated. So it's like, yeah. is there some nomenclature problem with this then? Yes. Yeah, because the, the UT seems to make it sound like it's... Well, the reporter doesn't get it, yeah. which is why we're that's going the there on Tuesday. Yeah. yeah. So I have a nice little exhibit that starts with 288 yeah. million and then subtractions. Local nonprofit developers have this much, you know, loans already made have this much, yeah. and it works its way down to zero. Oh, okay, interesting. And you know, the board has no, already approved you? loans no. for oh. projects that are starting in 2018 and 2019. Yeah. So you can't default on that. I yeah. see.
Because I'll just be in this room. Those are the calls that Western was saying. They said um, that the new prime minister, the showers work at the Millbridge Center, they said they haven't worked in two years. I know. All right. Yes. So we're uh, we're reconvening out of closed session, back into open session now, um, and. Uh, there is nothing to report out of closed session today, so thank you, every, everyone. Unless anyone has any further comments, I'll adjourn the meeting. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>